kind of story. Some years ago, my brother um, was dating a young lady named Carol, and uh, my brother was working at Okaboji Lutheran Bible Camp, and, and he was at a uh, youth ministry team there, and Carol was on a music ministry team with a gal named Amy, and then my brother later fills me in that Amy's met a fellow named Steve also, who happens to be this Steve. And so through my brother, and then his wife, and then Amy married Steve, and then I hear Steve's this crack um, New Testament student at Duke University, and then Steve ends up after all of that back in Minnesota, Amy's home territory, and he ends up pastoring a great church there, and, and I hear great things about him, and then I run into him again, guess where? Okaboji, it's in my book. It's a small place. And his wife Amy comes along and they bring their kids. And we all go to family camp together. And yeah, Steve's the speaker. Yeah. It's a small world. But here's Steve and he's ready. And we're, we should be ready. And let's go. All right. Thank you all. I think we may still be getting, is this working yet? It is? Okay, great. All right. I'm also really loud, I've been told, so <laughs> hopefully it's the microphone. Uh, my wife teases me, I don't have an indoor voice. Use your indoor voice. <laughs> it's really sweet to be here uh, in, in a number of ways. Uh, up in worship uh, just a minute ago, man, you, what a gift. Just what a gift to sing together, to pray together, and to share the sacrament together. It's, it's holy, and it's a privilege, it's a grace. Uh, my, my mind and heart were uh, taken back to this verse from uh, Romans uh, chapter 1. You don't have to, I'll invite you to read along with me if you have Bibles later, but right now let me just share this with you. Um, in Romans 1, the, the Apostle Paul is writing to this church in Rome full of Christians uh, whom he loves because they're in the Lord, but whom he has never met. Paul hadn't been to Rome, he didn't plant the church in Rome, he's hoping to get there sometime. And uh, in verse 11 he said, I'm longing to see you so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, or rather, and then he rethinks how he's thinking about it, so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And that's certainly the experience I was having upstairs. Uh, I, I was longing to come to Stratford, Iowa, uh, to come see all of you, um, hopefully be able to be of some service to you uh, during the multiple hours I'm going to be talking at you today, uh, but really the experience is one where we are mutually strengthened, mutually encouraged in one another's faith. It was a real sweet spirit to be uh, here. I, uh, I love being in Iowa. I'm from Minnesota these days. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I was born and raised in Cleveland. Uh, you're home of the greatest NFL team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they actually, I actually was a huge Browns fan back in the day because they, they won some games back in the 80s and 90s, 80s, I guess, when I was watching them. But uh, it turns out the 80s aren't really that recent anymore. <laughs> um, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I've lived in Minnesota for the last 14, almost 14 years now. I went to seminary there. That's how I met my wife and got roots in Minnesota. So I'm in Minnesota these days, but I love coming to Iowa. Uh, truth be told, this is my first time in Stratford. Is it the first time in Stratford for anybody else here too? Lots of people, right? Okay. All right. So what a great gift we all get to receive today. We're being mutually encouraged here. I told my staff in a staff meeting on Tuesday this week uh, that I was coming down here uh, to Stratford, Iowa. I have seven different Iowans uh, on my staff uh, because it's where all the best people come from, so we hire them. Uh, and of those seven, not a single one uh, knew where Stratford was. <laughs> like, well, I'll take a picture and I'll bring it back for you. Uh, so anyway, for today, I told Nathan, that didn't get published anywhere, did it, the title? Like, no. what is the, that's great, because I changed it, so uh, I don't even need to waste any time on that. Today, I'm going to talk to you about evangelism, discipleship, and the gospel of Jesus. So let me start with the topic of discipleship for a little bit. Uh, I should, I'm going to say by way of uh, sort of further introduction here. Uh, we've got two sessions together today. I'm hoping uh, to share some things with you, also to have at least some time for a discussion. Um, the first half, from now until lunch, uh, this is some material reworked a little bit for today, but that I've uh, taught in some other environments before, shared before, and found it to be helpful and encouraging. In the second session, later this afternoon, 
is really all new stuff, and I hope it's true and Christian, and we're going to see how it sounds when we get there. It's the way that I think as, as fellow members of the body of Christ together, we sharpen each other in, in our followership to Jesus. So, all right, we're going to start this session here uh, with discipleship, part one up here. All right, defining discipleship. It's kind of a slippery word, really, discipleship. I have a pastor friend who likes to talk about walnut words. He's like, they're not really difficult words. They're not real big. Discipleship's kind of a big word, but it's not as big as like ecclesiology or something like that. That they're walnut words. We know what they mean, but they got a rough, tough shell, a hard shell on the outside, and they've been worn smooth by frequent use. And we maybe have forgotten what's on the inside. And so it'd be helpful if we talk about these. I think words like faith and grace and mission are like this too. We all know them, and hardly any of us mean the same thing by them when we say them. Let me talk a little bit about discipleship. It's kind of a popular topic in the church these days, and it also happens to be what Jesus told us to do, right? In his parting words in the Gospel of Matthew, go make disciples. But I'm not sure that we always know what we mean by that. So my first task, I want to offer you a working image for discipleship. And then I want to talk with you a little bit about some myths about discipleship, at least one maybe that's holding us back in our thinking about discipleship, and therefore, uh, even more importantly, in our actual practice of making disciples. And in all this, at least this morning, I want to drive us back to the gospel to make sure we understand the gospel in its most biblical sense. So let's start with the word disciple. Jesus himself uses this word, although not actually that frequently. It's not all over the place. It's there in that really climactic ending passage in the Great Commission. The people who are around him a lot, who are learning from him, following him, they're called disciples. Uh, we don't know how many disciples Jesus had, actually. Uh, Twelve of them were pretty famous. Twelve of them were pretty significant. There was a narrower group than that. There were wider groups than that also. Disciple in English is a translation of the word mathetes. mathetes. There are less freighted English words that could also translate that Greek word that we find in the Gospels. I think some of the likely candidates for translating that word would be follower. That's not a bad one. Student is one that I've used over the years. I think that's a good one. Probably my favorite other translation of that word is apprentice, uh, is an apprentice to Jesus. One context for understanding this kind of relationship that uh, is used in the Bible itself also is the context of the relationship between parents and children. Children are apprenticed into the lives of their parents. We tell people in our church, in our children's ministries and student ministries, we believe that you are the primary disciplers of your children. And in fact, we're not asking you to do that. We're not challenging you. We're not holding it up so that you will become. You are the primary disciplers of your children into something. You are discipling them into something. We want to help you disciple them in the way of Jesus. Let me give you a couple of examples from, from my kids, uh, not super spiritual examples. <laughs> So my wife's a musician. I am so far the other end of the spectrum. I can't even tell when two notes are the same. I have no idea. My wife is a, a singer, a songwriter, musician, choir conductor, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I remember we used to, uh, well, this actually still happens a lot of times, but we, had, we would have gatherings of our sanctuary choir at my mother-in-law's house, who used to be the choir director at our church. So uh, I guess in some ways my wife is being apprenticed into her mother's role. Uh, and we're there gathered in my mother-in-law's house, which is right next door to our house. Uh, and, uh, uh, I tell people, it's like everybody loves Raymond, but good. It's like, uh, uh, she has a big gathering space in her house, the choir's there, and uh, my wife, somebody starts playing the piano, and my wife can often be seen standing in front of groups of people waving her arms, right, doing whatever choir directors do. Um, where's the choir director from today? No, I, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry to call you out. I mean, that. Um, uh, so my little two, three-year-old daughter... People start singing, the piano's playing, she gets up and starts doing this in front of people, right? Because that's what mom does, right? She's being apprenticed to do what she has seen. My son William is just turned 11, is 11 years old now, and he's not really over this yet, uh, but maybe it's a little less frequent. He used to, he'd want to, um, one of the things he saw me do that was distinctive that he wanted to do was put a belt on. Little boy pants often don't have belts, but big boy pants do, right? Dad wears a belt. I want to wear a belt. He loves wearing a tie. I'm not wearing a tie right now, but I wear a tie more than most people that he knows. He wanted to put on a tie. He, um, he knows it's distinctive about me that I'm a pretty early riser. I get up pretty early in the morning, and I get up really early in the morning on Sundays. I like to get to the building before anybody else. I like to pray through stuff. I like to think through what I'm going to teach and so that my heart is ready when anybody else shows up to start equipping and leading teams. So one Sunday morning, I get up about 
4.20 or so on Sunday mornings. I get up, I make coffee, make breakfast. I try to leave the house before 5. Who comes down the steps at like 4.45, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning? My son, right? This is when he was like 4 or 5 years old. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> the whole goal was I don't want to see anybody yet, you know? Like, but, I mean, I knew what he was doing, and I was able to be kind with him and tell him it was okay to go back to bed. Go, go lie down with mom. It'll be all right. You can sleep for like five more hours or something. You know? I don't know. Um, but, you know, he, he's growing up into the image that he sees his earthly father having, right? I mean, our kids imitate us for better or for worse, and a lot of times... It's worse. I'm trying to give you neutral examples right now. Um, Jesus himself used this image for discipleship. In Matthew 5, 43 and 44, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I would like it for you to be chips off the old block, right? You would, you would be apprenticed in the way of God. You would reflect the image of God. Same thing in Matthew 5, 9 in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Grow up to be a chip off the old block. And not only is that used in a positive way for discipleship to Jesus, there are other things you can be discipled to, and the same image is used for discipleship to the Pharisees. In Matthew 12, uh, verse 27, beginning in verse 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And then he says to the Pharisees, And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, which is not true, of course, but if I do, by whom do your children drive them out? Most translations don't use that, that word. They find another word. Your people is a common translation. But the, the, those who are discipled to you, those who are learning God from you, those who are learning life from you, those who are learning faith practice from you, children. I use this definition of discipleship, this definition of Christian apprenticeship in our congregation. I say discipleship to Jesus means we are learning to live life in the way of Jesus, and we are learning to know God in the way of Jesus. And I actually try to put that one first, and that's actually what I want to focus on for a few minutes here. We're learning to know God in the way of Jesus, and we're learning to live life in the way of Jesus. And the reason that I want to put that know God part first is because I think we get mixed up sometimes about discipleship. And we think that discipleship is that part of Christianity, that part of faith, where we finally get busy doing stuff, right? It's, all, it's about the programs and the activity and the, the burden and the responsibility or something like that. I think it's the whole picture. I think it's the whole picture. And it begins with knowing God in the way of Jesus. Let me illustrate this uh, with reference to some other religious or semi-religious forms of discipleship and knowing God. Let me start with Islam. If you are a disciple of Muhammad, if you are a disciple of the prophet Muhammad, people who, do, people who are disciples of Muhammad will get their image of God from the Quran, right? We'll learn to know God that way. It's not just a lifestyle or a law or something like that. There's a particular image of God going on. And people who are discipled to the prophet Muhammad will know God in the way of Muhammad, right? Or let's say the, another world religion, say Buddhism, right? If you are a devotee of Buddhism, which is almost a philosophy more than a religion, you will come to know God in the way of the Buddha. And you'll think about God very differently than how uh, anyone in a Judeo-Christian tradition or specifically a Christian tradition would know God. Let me bring it closer to home. Uh, probably very few Muslims and Buddhists here in the room right now, right? Um, devotees of the religion of Americanism, which I think can also be a religion, our, our civic religion, our culture, will imagine that God is a benevolent grandfather who just wants us to be happy and wealthy. Right? Somebody who doles out gifts and hopes, not, hopes the children don't bother him too much. If that's the case, we'll know God in the way of like Walt Disney or somebody who will disciple us in that image. Apprentice disciples of Jesus will know God in the Jesus way. And Jesus not only taught theories about God, he taught through experience. He taught through teachable moments. And he taught especially through meals. Jesus was infamous for eating with sinners. Right? It was, I think it's one of his most characteristic kingdom practices, actually. The Pharisees hated this about Jesus. They were constantly complaining about it. There are multiple instances throughout the Gospels where the Pharisees either ask Jesus, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? Or, they, or if they're tired of asking him, they'll ask his disciples, why does your master eat with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners? Why is he doing that? 
And in one very famous instance, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, Jesus answered with a story. I'm honestly not 100% sure if I should call it a story or three stories. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll treat it as three stories to begin with. First, in answer to this question, Jesus is at a, having a banquet, he's eating, he's having dinner, I don't even know what exactly it was like, but he was with people that the religious leaders thought that he shouldn't be with. And they were grumbling, oh, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And he said, let me tell you a story about this uh, shepherd who had a hundred sheep, right? And out of his hundred sheep, one of those sheep gets lost. He comes back to the sheep fold, they're coming in, he counts them up, 99 make their way back in, and one of them is not there. And he says, wouldn't you go searching for that one lost sheep? I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. Would, would a shepherd do that? Would we? This shepherd goes out. He searches the fields. He looks behind every bush. He looks in all the different low spots. He looks behind the rocks to find the sheep. He finally finds the sheep, and he scolds it, and he beats it. And he... No. no it's not. It's not. That's what some Christians do when they find lost sheep. He finds the sheep, and he puts it on his shoulders, and he carries it back home again. And then he calls all of his neighbors, <laughs> and he says, and it's probably the middle of the night, they're like, oh, stop bothering me, close the tent, you know? But he's, he's genuinely joyful. There is joy over this lost sheep, and Jesus makes the application, right? He says, so I tell you, there is much rejoicing in, sin, in heaven over one lost, on one lost sinner who is found. And then Jesus ups the ante a little bit, and he tells a second story. Not a not hundred sheep anymore, now there's this woman. She's got ten coins, right? There's ten times more valuable, only got, only got ten of them now. And she loses one coin. And so what does she do? Does she go, I'm still 90%, I, I'm good, whatever, I'm fine. Huh? No. She lights the lamp, she sweeps the house, she cleans up. Do you guys in your house only find things when you clean up? Like that happens to me. Find them later. 18 months later, I find the thing that I lost, right? She, she picks up the couches, she looks in the corner, she finally finds this coin, and she gets on her phone, and she best Facebook messages her friends, and she tells them, I found my lost coin. Come celebrate with me. She thinks they're going to be just as happy as she is. I don't know if they really would be or not, but she's so full of joy, right? It's out of joy for a treasure. She treasures this, and she finds it. And Jesus makes the application. It's rejoicing in heaven when a lost one is found. And then he tells the most famous story of all, and it's like three times longer than the first two stories put together. And he goes from 100 lost sheep to, I'm sorry, 100 sheep and one lost sheep to, to 10 coins and one lost coin. Now there's just two children, just two children. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger son said to his father, give me my share of the estate. I wish you were dead. All I really want is your money. I don't care about you. If I could get my share of the stuff right now, that'd be awesome. Right? And so his father gives it to him. You believe that? His father gives it to him. And then after not too long, he gathers up his newfound wealth, everything he has. I don't know exactly how he carried it because he didn't have as much currency. A lot of wealth was in terms of land. He must have liquidated it, must have sold the land somehow. I don't know. Sold rights to it. Takes off to the far country. All right? He goes out to the far country. And there, Jesus says in his story, one of my favorite phrases, he squanders his wealth in wild living. Right? You can only imagine. Right? And then, for who knows what, a whole bunch of reasons. He makes bad decisions, a famine strikes the land, nobody helps him out, perfect storm, he winds up with nothing. Right? So he hires himself out to a citizen of that country to feed pigs. Jesus is talking to Jewish people. Nothing could, I mean, he's just like rubbing salt in their womb. This guy is doing the stupidest, worst thing you could possibly imagine. You can have no sympathy for them. He insulted his father. He made dumb decisions. He went where he's not supposed to go. He's doing what he's not supposed to do. And he's hungry, and he wants to feed himself with the slop the pigs are eating, but nobody would help him out. He finally hits, must be rock bottom, somewhere underneath the pig mud is some rocks, and he hits rock bottom. And he says to himself, how many of my father's hired servants back home? Plenty to spare. And here I am starting to die. And he thinks to himself, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to take a risk on the character of my father. I don't know. I'm going to try it. I'm desperate enough. And so he practices a little speech, right? He gets his little speech together. And he goes, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired servants. He's working it up, right? And he's got to go a long way back home again. And I can just imagine that he's practicing his speech on the way home. It went, sometimes if I've got a tough conversation to have or some, some big moment, I'm kind of mulling it over in my head on the way there. I don't know how far away he was. I don't know if it was a two days walk. I don't know if it was a five day walk. I don't know what it was. But he's coming back home again. And he's rehearsing his speech, I can only imagine. And he's playing these tapes. I'm no longer worthy. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but, but make me like one of your hired servants. And he gets back home and his father sees him. Well, he's a long way off, right? 
And the story says he comes running down the road after his son. I sometimes like to ask people, what does it take to see someone while they're still a long way off? What increases the odds? If you're looking, right? He's, if, if he's got a, out of the corner of his eye, he's always wondering, maybe he'll come home. I don't know, maybe he'll come home. His heart is, is out there. And he sees his son, and he starts running down the road after him. Okay? If you were down the road, and you saw, and after all you had done, and your father started running at you, right? Would, you don't, I don't know if I would think that was a good thing, right? It's okay if I went down for now. I get it back. Oh, sorry. That's all right. We don't need that yet. Okay. We're good. All right. So his father's running down the road, right? And I wonder from how far away can you see if his hands are open or closed? <laughs> his father is running down the road after him, and he gets there, and the kid starts his speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But in Jesus' story, he can't finish his speech because his father goes, Quick! Bring the best robe. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. The son of mine. He was dead, and he's alive again lost and he's found. And he wants to throw a party. He wants to throw a feast, right? Because he's so full of joy for his lost son who was found. And then Jesus' story turns in the middle, right? I don't know if you remember this or not, but there's a, there's a key word in the middle. It says, meanwhile. meanwhile. I, I remember a different story. A musician I heard once in the middle of a song. He said, uh, when I'm telling the story, you can imagine that the music now begins to play in a minor key. <laughs> meanwhile, the older son was out in the field. <laughs> And he heard music and dancing. He'd be like, what the heck is going on in the house, right? And one of the servants comes to him and says, says, in eagerness, expecting the older brother to be as happy as the father is, right? And he says to the older brother, is your, your, your brother has come home and your father's found him. He's killed the fatted calf. We're so happy about this. But the older brother was not joyful, right? The older brother was angry. And his father goes out to him also. The father goes out to him and and has to plead with him. Can you imagine the indignity of the father having to plead with the older son to come on into the party that I'm throwing? You ought to be there. You should be at my right hand throwing this party. But he's not, right? And the older brother, he says, this son of yours has squandered our property with prostitutes. The older brother never calls the younger brother brother. He always says, this son of yours, right? The, the, the father says, your brother. But the brother says, your son. <laughs> like my wife and I do sometimes. Do you know what your daughter did? <laughs> I imagine him spitting this son of yours. And then, at the end of the story, the father says to the older brother that reinforces his place in the family, but we had to rejoice and be glad because he was lost and he's found. He was dead and he's alive. The story ends. And we have no idea what the older brother decides to do. Right? That's, that's a dramatic point, I think. Jesus is telling the story in the context of all these people at his table, right? All these younger brothers who are being surrounded or attacked, scorned by older brothers, right? Who have no joy over their return to the party. Sorry about that, you suck. <laughs> who have no joy over the return of these younger brothers to the party. And Jesus is having to explain in the context of both his table guests and the Pharisees, he's telling these stories. And I think to the, I think to the table guests, he wants them to hear that they're loved, right? that they're treasured, that even if there were 99 righteous persons and only one unrighteous, I imagine that the number of people at his table was actually greater than the Pharisees. It was probably reversed. But even if there were only one of you, the Father would rejoice over you. There'd be rejoicing in heaven over you. I, would, I think he wants them to know that they are valuable. The woman had actual treasure, actual money. It had precious value. That God values you like that. I think he wants them to know that even if they've done the worst, if they insulted their father and made stupid decisions and squandered their money and went places they shouldn't have gone and did horrible things and broke God's law, that the father rejoices at their return. Right? I think he wants them to hear that. But I, I think in this context, they're the secondary audience. I think the Pharisees are the primary audience. They're the ones who are complaining, and Jesus tells the story to explain. Why are you always eating with tax collectors and sinners? Why? Because that's what God is like. Because that's what God does. I'm, I'm just doing what God does. The question here isn't, why am I doing this? The question is, why aren't you? Why aren't you, right? You want to know God in the way of Jesus? Jesus teaches that God is like this. But I think to raise the stakes even just a little bit higher, Jesus not only teaches that God is like this, Jesus embodies the God who is like this, right? Who is it in the storyline of the Gospels 
who is out there searching and finding the lost? Right? Who's, who's doing that? Who is it in the storyline of the Gospels who's throwing the banquets and rejoicing and having dinners with people? It's Jesus himself. So it's not that just that Jesus had an idea about God that we might prefer to other ideas about God. It's that Jesus came and brought God to us, right? So these are, these are theological parables, technically speaking, theological. They, they explain God. They're parables about the character of God. But I think, like many of Jesus' parables, they're also Christological parables. They're parables by which he's interpreting himself, parables that explain to us why he is who he is, how he is who he is, why he does what he does. They, they explain and reveal Jesus, who explains and reveals God. In the interest of time, I'm just going to skip right to some discussion questions here. Let me give you a couple minutes to talk about something. If discipleship is apprenticeship to Jesus, it means knowing God in the way of Jesus and living life in the way of Jesus. I want to give you five minutes to talk at your tables. How does this encourage or challenge your own discipleship to Jesus? In fact, let me give you one more encouragement that I like about the word uh, apprentice. Uh, and. Even I like it a little bit better than the word follower in this way, though I've often talked about being followers of Jesus. The, the thing about an apprentice is you're supposed to screw it up, right? You're, you're not there yet. I think the word apprentice includes lots of challenge and lots of vision and a goal and what's supposed to be happening and what you work for, and I like all that. I like all that. But I think it also, I think it also carries along a, a sense of grace, a recognition that we are incomplete. And we believe that God will bring to completion the work that he has begun in us, but it's an incomplete work, right? I like that a little better than the word follower, because when an apprentice messes up, an apprentice is still an apprentice. I still have my relationship with Jesus. When a follower is not following, I don't know if they're still followers, <laughs> right? If a follower is not following, they're just taking their own walk. <laughs> so I, I kind of like the word apprentice for that reason. Let me encourage you in that. How does this encourage or challenge your discipleship to Jesus to begin with knowing God this way? How might this influence your work in making disciples of Jesus? If, if you have a witness to anybody in the world, if you, if you by your way of life, if you by specific conversation, if you by testimony, are uh, helping other people to become apprentices of Jesus, how would this vision of discipleship influence that work? And then uh, how does this influence your work together in churches? I don't know if you're sitting with people that you're part of the same church or not. But how does, this, uh, how does this influence your work in building a culture of discipleship in the community that you're a part of in your church? All right, uh, take five minutes on that and I'll, I'll bring us back together soon.
Discipleship is what comes after evangelism. It seems right, doesn't it? It seems right. Let me tell you why I think we might want to unlearn that. I, I learned that, first of all, as a, as a young evangelical, I was really active uh, in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship when I was in college. That was a place where I did a lot of spiritual growing up. I learned a lot of important things there. I learned some things I needed to unlearn. 
as in nearly every season of life. I learned it as a Lutheran seminarian, which was so different going from that environment to then being a student at Luther Sem back in the late 90s. We used different words there. I learned, I can't remember anybody using the word evangelism while I was there. I learned that first there is justification, and then maybe there is sanctification. And you evangelize for justification and you disciple for sanctification if you're into sanctification. I learned it from church structures also. I've been in churches that are organized with evangelism committees and discipleship committees. Maybe some of your churches have that too. And there could be some upside to that to try to make sure a couple different kinds of things get done, but it's also problematic. I learned it from the way that Christians talk. Have you ever heard somebody, I, I have, I think I've used this language myself, call something a discipleship issue? Mm, that's a discipleship issue. Something in somebody's character, something about the way they carry themselves in marriage, something about the way, something about their relationship with honesty or their relationship with the truth. Something about their language, maybe. Servant-heartedness, entertainment choices. Those are discipleship issues. But we're careful not to call them evangelism issues because then evangelism would seem like you had to get your life in order before you could come to know Jesus. You had to, it'd be too harsh and too legalistic. It would put up boundaries. But if that's our instinct around evangelism, do we really want our discipleship to be driven by legalistic or harsh or burden? Is it okay to leave the logic of the gospel behind when you get on to living the gospel life? Now we're on to discipleship, which is the part after you get saved, where you finally get serious about your faith and you start cleaning up your act. There's something about that that doesn't fit together. In fact, I think the separation of evangelism and discipleship from one another creates practical problems. One of the problems I've seen that it creates is that it allows churches to pick one. We're an evangelism church. Or we're a discipleship church, right? Either you love lost people, and then you probably don't call them lost people, but I'm going to do it right now for a second. Or you do evangel and you do evangelism and you see people get saved. Or other churches are serious about Bible teaching, doctrine, prayer, obedience, and they do discipleship. And each one looks down their nose at the other for not loving lost people enough or not cultivating authentic relationship with Jesus. Is it possible, is it conceivable that as a church, we would actually be allowed to pick one of those. It also, I think, has made it hard for people to move from getting saved to getting obedient. Mm -hmm. Our churches are full of people, full, my church is full of people, who say they believe in Jesus, but they don't actually seem to believe in any of his ideas, teachings, practices, or example. People say yes to Jesus once in their life, and then they never say yes to him again. I think we've created a leap between evangelism and discipleship, and we have often not been successful in helping people make the unnatural leap that we have created for them. I think the separation causes practical problems, but it arises from, and it reinforces, a theological misunderstanding. I think it arises from a misunderstanding of the gospel itself. So I'd like to take a run at regrounding our understanding of the gospel. Because we already have some categories in our minds, in our Christian experience and community for understanding that word. And they're not the same categories as the people who heard Jesus use that word in the first place. They had some different categories. They heard that word in a different way. Jesus did not invent that word. It meant something in its original context. It meant something like good news about the king or good news about the victory of the king. That's how that word was already in play when the Christians first began, when Jesus began to use it. To illustrate this, a little while ago, I, I wrote a little story to try to put this in context. It's uh, a story, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story here. It's a story that, uh, fiction, totally fiction, uh, set in about the time of Jesus, maybe a little bit after the time of Jesus, around the time, 60, 70 AD, imagine, when the gospel of Jesus was going around, and people were writing gospels of Jesus. When people were hearing the summary of Jesus' gospel message, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe this gospel. So imagine with me for a moment. Imagine an average Joe who lived in Mark's world, the gospel writer Mark, a little before Mark's time, maybe in between Jesus' time and Mark. Let's say this average Joe, let's say his name in his world was Alexander. Now Alexander was a humble guy. He farmed the land that had been in his family since before anyone could remember. And it was good land. A little hilly, he noticed more and more as he got older and his knees began to remind him of how hard he was working. 
but he grew figs and olives on that land, which his family ate with special pleasure. They believed they were the best figs and olives grown anywhere nearby, and Alexander sold and bartered his crop at the market. In exchange for his produce, he brought home milk to drink and cloth that his wife Livia made into clothes and blankets. They never had too much, but they only rarely had too little, and they lived their life quietly and didn't want trouble. But their lives were not without scars. When Alexander and Livia were younger, they had known mostly peace, but the minor kings of local tribes had grown bolder in recent years. The peacekeeping powers of Rome were preoccupied with their own affairs. The assassination of Julius Caesar had brought chaos to the whole realm. His adopted son, Octavian, the heir to the throne, had been betrayed by his friend and ally, Mark Antony. And Octavian and Antony were spending all their energies and the resources of the Republic trying to outmaneuver one another to seize control for themselves. And luxuries like providing security for farmers on the borderlands weren't getting much attention anymore. And it was because of this that Alexander and Livia had lost their oldest son two years ago. He was 14. He'd have been 16 now. He had the body of a man, but the head of a boy, brimming with courage, still lacking wisdom. When some lieutenants of a nearby tribal king were threatening to steal the produce from Alexander's fields, the boy threatened them right back. You touch this field and you might not live to regret it. And the fight that resulted from those words caused enough pain and injury to the men that they decided to pick on easier targets next time. But the boy paid for that reputation with his life. Alexander cursed the olives that had been traded for the life of his son. He'd trade them back in a minute if he could. <coughs> of course he couldn't. And in addition to his grief, now Alexander lived with a constant low-grade fear. When would the next threats come? Today? Next week? Next month? And what about his other kids? Or his wife? Would he lose them and his livelihood next time? And although he couldn't prove it, he was sure that people were damaging his crops at night while he slept. Life was a struggle every day now. And then one day, Alexander got news that changed all that. He was sitting down to eat with his family when a young man came running by the house. Out of breath from having done this all day, half panting with no energy for polish or explanation, he blurts out that Octavian had finally secured the front. His rivalry with Antony had actually settled down last fall when Antony died in Egypt. And since that time, Octavian had returned to Rome and solidified his power. The armies were under his unified command, and the Senate was giving him more and more authority. Soon they would even begin to call him Caesar Augustus. The local chieftains and the bands of raiders would have to learn their place as security returned to the region. Alexander noted silently to himself that the recent decrease in threatening activity must have been no coincidence. There was a new sheriff in town, and the criminals had known it even before he did. There was still certainly some mopping up to do in that area. But this was beginning to feel like a whole new day, like the long night of waiting was over. And Alexander's life began to improve dramatically. The crops on the edges of the field were mysteriously staying much healthier now. So his family ate better and took better crops to market. The scars of his loss remained, but his heart began to lighten considerably. The constant fear for the safety of his family began to recede, and soon he would wake up without a pit in his stomach for the first time in two years. Alexander had been the victim of strong and wicked powers for a long time, and he was no match for them. They were stealing his life right out from underneath him. But now a stronger and better power had arisen. Augustus would have his own detractors, of course, but for Alexander, he was a savior. And his arrival to power was a whole new day for Alexander and his world. And the people of Alexander's world had a word for that news, for the report that was brought to them by the young man running from town to town with the report of good King Octavian. They called it good news. In fact, they called it the gospel. There's, a, there's an ancient Greek stone carving from around that same time in history that celebrates the salvation of the world accomplished by Caesar Augustus. The inscription comes from a town called Prien. It says, the birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the gospel for the world which came through him. And they revered Augustus as a god. Sometimes he was called the son of God because he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. So people proclaimed the gospel of the reign of Caesar Augustus. 
There were other instances of the same thing. Similar gospels or pronouncements of good news are recorded by other ancient sources. At the end of a war, the end of a long, bloody war, good news of victory and peace now would be carried by sailors, sailors to distant lands. When the emperor Vespasian's reign was secured, very close to the time of Mark's writing, a gospel message was delivered to him while he was in Egypt, reporting that his opponents had finally succumbed. There's a Jewish historian who goes by the name of Josephus, and Josephus wrote, On reaching Alexandria, where Vespasian was, Vespasian was greeted by the gospel from Rome, the whole empire being now secured, and the Roman state now saved beyond expectation. This is how people heard the word gospel in, the, in Jesus' wider world. It's also how the word gospel is used in the Bible Jesus read in the prophet Isaiah. The gospel is good news about the king, but in this case, the king is God. The king is Yahweh. In Isaiah chapter 40, you may have heard these verses before. Isaiah 40, verses 9 and 10. You who bring the gospel to Zion, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring the gospel to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. The reigning king, the Lord comes with power. He rules with a mighty arm. His reward is with him. His recompense accompanies him. Or in Isaiah 52, verse 7, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring the gospel, who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. All right? God is the king and he is reigning. Now, one thing I want you to notice about this kind of gospel, these categories for gospel that are so natural to Jesus' world and to the scriptures themselves, is how when you hear a gospel proclamation, you are immediately put into a position of no neutrality, right? You will respond. Everybody responds to the gospel. When Alexander and everybody like him were sitting by their tables along the countryside, and the guy who came along and brought the euangelion, the gospel, and by the way, the name for somebody who brings a gospel like that was a, a, a euangelistes, an evangelist. <laughs> they came through bringing the gospel. And you hear that good news, you kind of have two options. One, gratitude and loyalty and fealty to the king. Bow the knee, say, thank God, Caesar's on the throne, or whoever it is. And if you're not, rebellion, right? I mean, those are kind of your two choices. You're a loyal subject of the king, or you're not. Everybody responds to the gospel. And the early church then applied this word to the narratives of Jesus, to the stories of Jesus' life that we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They said, those are gospels. Those are announcements. Those are tellings of the story of good King Jesus. They were narrative theologies of the crucified and resurrected King Jesus and of the inauguration of the reign of God in Jesus and among his people. In other words, what they told was, they told in story form the simple good news message that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in power as the world's true Lord and King. And when people said yes to this message, when they were loyal to this message, when they received this message, their confession was really the same words as the announcement. They agreed with the announcement and confessed it for themselves. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that, by the way, is the very first Christian creed. Hundreds of years before people gathered at Nicaea or Chalcedon, before there was such a thing as a Nicene Creed or a Chalcedonian formula or an Apostles' Creed, however and whenever that finally formed, way before that, the Christians had a defining creed. You can find it in a few places already in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's our creed. It's also there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. No one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. That's what it takes to confess the creed. In Philippians chapter 2, in the great story of Jesus, who humbled himself and was found in human likeness and became obedient, even to the point of death, death on the cross, whom God raised up and exalted to the highest place. When people confess the truth about Jesus, what will every tongue confess? That Jesus is Lord, right? That's the truth that we confess. That's our faith. It's the gospel. It's what we agree with. Now, I have to point out that this is a little different from how we normally construe the gospel. The gospel that many of us, that I, learned to speak is narrower than this. We are careful to confess that Jesus is Savior. He is Savior from our sins before we ever get to the complicated, dangerous part about Jesus being Lord. I think because somewhere along the way, we lost track of the story, somewhere along the way, the Lord part began to feel like that was demand, like that was obligation, like that was law. Like, I remember, I remember learning the phrase as a young Christian, you can't call him Savior without calling him Lord. Maybe you've heard that phrase too. 
But I think that bifurcation, that division of Savior and Lord, actually messed us up early on. What I'm advocating here for is, a, is returning the Lordship of Jesus to the Gospel. But I'm not advocating for confusing law and Gospel, or a perversion of the Gospel into law. That's not what it means that Jesus is Lord. It is good news for the world that Jesus is Lord. This isn't about what you have to do, what you have to decide, what way you have to order your life in order to make Jesus Lord of your life. Like you could make Jesus anything, right? You have to have a pretty high opinion of yourself to think that you could make Jesus something that he isn't already. The gospel message is that Jesus is Lord. It's, the fa it's a fact. It's the truth. Jesus is Lord, indicative mood, full stop. And Jesus is Savior precisely because Jesus is Lord. Because Jesus is Lord over the power of sin and all the forms of sin by which Satan uses it to injure God's good world. By all the ways that Satan tries to usurp a diminishing, dehumanizing, life-stealing lordship <coughs> over us, we say back, Jesus, not Satan, is Lord. Well, that's good news. It's just that we lost the narrative, I think, in which this makes sense. We kind of let it go over the generations. We've lost track of the story of the Bible and the Bible's vision for the reign of God over all the earth and the new creation of heaven and earth and the restoration and the calling of all humanity. In place of this biblical gospel, I think we have sought what Dallas Willard uh, helpfully called an irreducible minimum gospel. I mean, I can, I can really remember being drawn to this kind of thinking. All right, what's, what's the basic essence of, if you boiled it all down, if you bottom lined it, what's the minimum amount of the gospel? What's the clearest, simplest thing there could be? When you get to the bottom line, what's the essential gospel? Of course, I think his question back was, why would I want a minimum gospel? But the reason I think that we've been so attracted to a bottom line gospel is because our imaginations, somewhere along the way, stopped being shaped by the whole narrative of the Bible and instead became shaped by the worldview of modern Western capitalism or something. And a minimum kind of gospel is efficient. It can be mass produced. It's scalable. It's controllable. We can bottom line it, exercise quality control over it, and get it out there. In this way, I think we maybe are more discipled to Henry Ford or John Rockefeller or somebody than we are apprenticed to Jesus. Now, I have to say, I am really sympathetic to those motives, though. I'm very sympathetic to those motives. I want as many people as possible to know the gospel of Jesus and come into a saving relationship with him. But I'm afraid that maybe we gave away our soul in the process. That maybe we gave away what the Bible said the gospel was for a gospel that we could more easily mass produce. And the clearest indicator, I think, of our confusion here is the Great Commission itself. This, this inspiring, beating heart Bible text for all people with evangelistic fervor. Jesus told us to grow the church, expand the kingdom, reach the lost. This is it. This is the passage. I've heard it said that great churches know how to balance great commission energy for evangelism with great commandment energy for discipleship. Growing in God. Growing in love for God and neighbor. Maybe you've heard the phrase, I, I think um, Rick Warren said it, I don't know if he made it up or not. I have a great commitment to the Great Commission and the Great Commandments. Which is not a bad phrase, actually, if you hold them together instead of thinking that they're separate. Because the Great Commission doesn't say, get people saved, gather decisions, multiply converts. It doesn't say that. The very fundamental evangelism text itself says, make disciples, right? These two things go together. Evangelism and discipleship, I think, are the same thing. They are bowing the knee to King Jesus. Now you see the king beating back the powers of evil, the power of sin, the wages of sin. The first time you say yes to the good news of Jesus, that he is Lord, cannot by definition be the last time you say yes to him, right? Once you say he's Lord, all the rest of your answers are already figured out for you. They just keep being yes, right? So here's my question with the Great Commission in mind. If your evangelism, fueled by your understanding of the gospel, converts somebody to something, if your evangelistic ministry makes them into something that they previously were not, they experienced that thing that all of us evangelicals love talking about, life change, right? life transformation, 
If you make them into something, and that something is not a disciple of Jesus, what on earth have we made them? There's no other category, right? When people say yes to the gospel, and let me say it again, we must continue to be passionate about people saying yes to the gospel who haven't before. They are saying, yes, Jesus is Lord. Praise God, that's true. I acknowledge him and receive him, and I want to live in that life, and I want to reflect his character. I want to follow him. So here's my point, and uh, then a question that we can discuss over lunch. I'm rather impressed that we're going to have lunch almost on time. <laughs> here's my point. We need to stop separating evangelism and discipleship. Distinguish between them, okay. Make sure we don't lose the kinds of things we're aiming for, great. But let's stop imagining they're so separate. It's not helping us. I think it's making our evangelism shallow. I think it's making our discipleship legalistic. It has a tendency to tempt us to pick which one of those things we care about most. And I think, worst of all, I think it might unwittingly move the person of the Lord Jesus out of the center of both of them. Right? No longer what drives Christ, where Jesus is at the center, but let's bring them together to do that. If we allow them to be separated, I think what can happen is that evangelism goes from becoming, where it, it leaves behind what it ought to be, which is becoming personally attached to Jesus, being loyal to him, to the Lord. And it becomes instead about the enlightened self-interest of salvation. Yes, I'll, if I would like to go to heaven when I die, what would it take to do that to get that benefit for me? Rather than Jesus is Lord and I want to follow him. And discipleship goes from becoming increasingly personally attached to Jesus and conformed to his image and becomes instead about allegiance to rules or memorization of knowledge or participation in certain kinds of discipleship programs. But it's not Jesus himself, the living, risen, reigning Lord Jesus, who's at the center of both of them. I think we put evangelism and discipleship back together, we just might save them both. So I have one discussion question for you. My discussion question for you uh, over lunch is this. Think about your church community, your family, your house church, your congregation, whatever your context is like, and ask yourselves these questions. What's our plan for making disciples of Jesus? Whether that's people who never knew him before or people who have said yes to Jesus but then decided they could stop saying yes to Jesus. What's our plan for making disciples of Jesus? And is it working? That's it. Shall I pray before lunch, or would somebody else like to? Well, you want to. You have or is there the anything else to do before lunch? I don't think so. You okay. have the microphone. We're kind of in it. We're kind of in it. What's that? You have the microphone. Oh, yeah, right on. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, cool, I'd love to. Is there, are there any announcements and instructions? Regarding lunch? Um, you know, hopefully we'll have a little bit of mingling time so that they can set things out there. And you'll we'll have two lines that start... Um, one over there, one over there, and you'll come to the middle and come out this way. You'll get, you'll get your uh, chicken, uh, a scalped chicken, and a roll, and then there'll be salads on the table here, so help yourselves. If there are any of you, of you that want a gluten-free meal, you'll just have to ask, because there is a, some bread, um, bread pieces in the chicken casserole. So we wanted to make sure that if, if somebody needs otherwise, there's just some slices of turkey back there that you can get instead of that. And Dave. Roger and I will sing the table prayer for you. Oh, oh great. awesome. Well, you come to our retreat center in Arizona. This is yeah. the one you need to learn. Awesome. <laughs> uh,